Thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, braving the uh, not as cold weather as it was on uh, the weekend, or Saturday and Friday. So thank you for everybody for coming out. And um, let's just uh, bow our heads and uh, we'll say uh, a prayer. Thank you, God, for gathering us together in your holy house, Lord. And uh, just uh, be with us today as we uh, listen to uh, worship music this morning and uh, listen to a testimony this morning, and we hear Bruce's word this morning, Lord. Let, let the message fall on our hearts, and let us leave with joy and happiness from this service. Amen. Quick announcements. Um, so the, the service this morning will not be live streamed, I was informed. Um, so just, uh, I guess you can catch it on YouTube afterwards. If you uh, are want to see it again. Um, prayer will be available after the service here at the front. Uh, Dave and Cheryl have uh, graciously uh, said that they would listen to prayers this morning. So if you have anything that's on your hearts, please feel free to come in the morning after the service. Um, and then um, this Wednesday uh, morning, prayer at uh, Pastor Bruce's place uh, at 7 a.m. If you feel so inspired to come, please do. You're always welcome. I'm sure there'll be coffee. Um, and uh, if you have any uh, prayer testimonies that you want to share, please speak to Pastor Bruce after the service. He'll be glad to uh, set something up for you. Um, now, last year, Red Ribbon Company, uh, last year Revive did our first food drive for St. Vincent, and it was a uh, it was very successful. Uh, we're going to try to do it again this year. Uh, if you are interested in helping or learning more, uh, there will be a meeting next Sunday after church on February 12th. Um, next slide. Karen Share. Karen Share in two weeks, uh, February 18th uh, at the Fasts. Um, please email Dave or Cheryl for more info. And then a big thank you uh, to Ellen and Marie uh, for organizing the uh, pop look last Sunday. It was a great success. Thank you, ladies. And Youth Unlimited. Uh, the regular uh, meeting every Friday. And uh, I just wanted to add, uh, Youth Unlimited uh, Spaghetti Supper was success, success yesterday. Thank you to all who uh, came out and supported. Um, if you were not able to come, but would like to contribute, uh, there will be a yellow can in the hall over here, uh, marked with uh, the word donations on it, uh, should you wish to add your support. All contributions will go to the Blizzard Youth Retreat uh, that they will be attending in Muskoka. February 10th to the 12th. Let's uh, welcome the uh, worship team to the, to the front. Thank you.
Father, that, that will be a day. That will be a day. When we enter into your presence and we see all that you have made for your children, for those who have cast their faith and stood strong and had the courage to believe upon you. Oh, Father, we look forward to that day when everything will be set right. Thank you, Lord. Hold us until that time. Hold us until that day. You are the faithful one. We trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I, um, this past week, was reading some of the Word in, in a couple different spots, and I had some verses that challenged me a bit that I wanted to share this morning. So the first one is found in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And it starts off, I appeal. 
And I, for fun, decided to just look what other translations say. And, and you have words like exhort, implore, beg, urge, beseech. So you get the picture that it's just like, please, please, please listen to what I'm going to say. And then a couple more words in it says brothers. And we all know that that just means everyone. So it says, I appeal, I beg, I urge you to you, therefore, brothers, all of you, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then the other verses were found in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 21 and 22. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And so, as I sat with that, the challenge that arose for me was asking myself some questions. What things fail the test? What things am I doing that is conforming to this world? What am I allowing to transform my mind? What things are evil? What things are good and acceptable and perfect? And it really didn't take too long for a few things to come to mind as I, as I sat with that. And as I sat with that and I thought about, well, what if I just totally removed those things from my life then? Some of that was a little uncomfortable. I didn't like the idea of maybe having to push those things out the door. Um, because not that they're inherently evil, but they're just things that were sucking time or, or uh, putting my focus where it didn't need to be. And as I, as I wrestled with that a bit, the, the word addiction came to mind. And I love the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. I have the app on my phone. If you don't have it, it's great. Anyway, I just plugged in addiction. And this is what it said. The act of devoting or the state of being devoted to. And a more modern definition would be dependency on. But as I sat with that, I thought, what am I or who am I devoted to? And we know that addictions can come in many forms. Just last week we had a um, teen challenge here talking about drug and alcohol addiction. But there's other forms of addiction. Um, you, you can be addicted to uh, a person, to work, uh, social media, people pleasing, the pursuit of money, gaming, just screens in general. There's lots of things I could go on. Um, and, and I know that I want to be able to stand up here and say that I am devoted to my God, to the King of the universe. But I, I had to sit and look and see that there were a few things in my life that were taking up space that they shouldn't. And see, I have the privilege of knowing that I get to stand up here again next week. And before, I don't know what God will lay on my heart to share next week, but before I do, when I stand up here next week, I want to be able to look at you all and say, it was a good week. I was able to shelf those things. I'm a little more devoted to him today than I was a week ago, and a little less devoted to those other things. So I'm going to pray for us this morning, and my challenge this morning is that I'm going to give a time of silence. My challenge is that you would ask God, is there one or two things that are taking up space in my life that I need to shelf or possibly completely get out of my life. And then I'll pray for us. And I also want to say that I have my prayer journal with me. And if God lays something on your heart this morning, that is something you need to just get out of your life or at least shelf it for a while. Come and tell me and I'll write your name. You don't have to tell me what it was. I'll write your name and I'll be in prayer for you this week. But I'll pray for you right now. Father God, we want our lives to be a spiritual worship to you. 
We don't want to conform to this world. We do want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in you. We want to be able to discern your will and know what is good and acceptable and perfect. So Lord, I just lay before you these few minutes where we sit and we ask you what it is, Lord, that you want us to shelve or completely remove from our lives. Bring to mind these things for us, Lord. Father, we know that you desire for us to draw close to you. You desire more than we do to remove these things from our lives so that our focus can be free to focus on you and to be about your business. So I pray that you would give each of us, Lord, the strength we need to set these things aside. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Sure. Um, I'm going to take this moment to invite uh, Rebecca and Jennifer up to the front if they want to say a few words to you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so we'll make this quick and to the point. Um, Renee already kind of gave us an idea of how it went last night, and that's amazing. It was so cold last night, and we had close to 50 people show up. So, woohoo! Great job. <laughs> and everybody was warm. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank, we have some pretty awesome volunteers in this church, and I think it's really important that we thank people when they step forward and make a lot of effort. So, uh, our youth and leaders wanted to give a special thanks to Marie Reimers. She ran off her feet in that kitchen. <laughs> and uh, Nicole Canal, Sarah Taylor, Jennifer Auer, and Karina Canal all contributed to making food, prepping food, serving food, and, along with the leaders and the volunteers, and it was a really fun night. I, for those of you who came, uh, they all said they really loved it. So um, I just wanted to say too, the goal that the teens had, um, they pretty much got three quarters of the way there with only uh, one third of the people we were hoping to have. So God's a God of abundance. So if you still wanted to help them reach the rest of their goal, like uh, Renee said, there's a little can right here. And actually what's more important to me is these are prayer cards. And there's going to be some pretty cool things happening on the weekend, besides all the fun stuff <laughs> that you saw on the video. Um, it's an opportunity for the youth to meet hundreds of other teens who are also seeking God in their lives and trying to make, figure out where God fits in all the details, details of their daily lives. So this is a prayer card, so please take one. And it, it's a suggestion of how you could be praying for the group as we head on this amazing opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, certain uh, local uh, businesses. Uh, we did a silent auction, uh, which was quite friendly and a bit competitive. Uh, if you were here, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the list. Uh, LL Photography, which is Lindsay McIntosh, New York's Bakery, Maxwell Front Machinery, Home Hardware, uh, McEwins, which is Gallery, uh, Gary and Valerie Martin, Wicato Pizza, Maxwell Pharmacy, uh, Maxwell Pharmacy uh, Angela and Logan McIntosh, North Hungary, which is Adriano and Marie Clot, Trolley, uh, Cedar and Fern, Left and Right, Sunset Meadow Farm, uh, Reimer Family, Home Group, Nicole and Richard Canal, Epicure Rep, Karina Canal, uh, 
Brenda and Patrick Taylor, uh, Color Street and Nails, Kathy DeMars, Goulet family, and then uh, donated food for our dinner. Came from the Full Bellies, Amy Willis, Northman Clary, Adriano and Mary Claude, Mary O'Trolley, Goulet family, Weimer family, Taylor family, and Canal family. So a lot of people coming together, and I just would like to thank all those people. Thank you very much for believing in our youth. Thank you. Thank you, thanks. Uh, I just take this moment now to dismiss the children from Sunday school. So there was a little bit of a hiccup uh, this morning. Um, the uh, prayer book was not put out for anybody to write any prayer requests. So um, I'm going to read the ones that were from last week. Uh, if there's anybody that needs uh, to add something now, uh, I guess I'm going to just take, take one or two and uh, go from there. Um, so, um, so last week it was uh, Zarina, Zarina's mom had arrived. Uh, Faith Anna asked her to pray for Janine and Elijah. And by the way, also note Elijah's birthday today. Congratulations, Elijah. Um, <laughs> Brett wants to thank everyone for prayers um, that, uh, that with her back. So just continue those prayers. Um, Sue's friend, uh, please, with breast cancer, please pray for peace and healing. Uh, and... Uh, Alicia is in her 39th uh, week of pregnancy, would be probably the 40th week now, and uh, no news yet, obviously. So um, they're still waiting expectantly, and I want to add that we can pray for Bruce, who is leaving next week, Wednesday? Tuesday. Tuesday next week for, for a slave, slave of travel. And uh, that's all from the list. Is there anybody else that has anything? Yes, please. Uh, Has to do with his hearing? Yeah. Okay. And what's his name? Joshua. Joshua. We just want to pray for Joshua. Uh, we've been praying for him before. For uh, he got in to see a uh, doctor quickly uh, after we prayed for him. So we just want to pray for him. He's going to have uh, su surgery again. No, he already had the surgery. We're praying that the results might get the results. So that we finally get the results from that. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Elaine. Yeah, so What's your name again? Tina. Tina. So Richard and uh, Ellen want to pray for Tina, who suffered cardiac arrest, and they were not hopeful that she would pull through, but uh, God's amazing. Uh, he had performed a miracle, and uh, she's up and walking and talking, and uh, her memory might be a little bit fuzzy, but, you know, she, she's on the road to recovery, so we're very thankful. <laughs> Last one, So we want to pray. Uh, the Sousa family wants to pray for Ed, who fell off a ladder and uh, uh, had a head injury, and we just want to pray for his recuperation. So, okay. Uh, one more, that's it. <laughs>
Yeah. So, Prime Minister, we thank you for all the prayer for Patrick. Just continue to pray, pray for them that as he continues on with his, his uh, treatment for uh, diabetes. Okay, that's it. So, I'm just going to bow our heads and I'll just. Lord, uh, I lift all these prayers up to you. And, uh, Lord, I just ask you to meet everyone where they're at for sickness, for joyful. Uh, for those that are still struggling to, uh, with uh, sickness or mental health, Lord, please meet them where they're at. Lord, and we just, we're just so thankful, Lord, that you are our God and that you love us and that you care for us and you meet us where we need to be met, Lord, and uh, we're just so thankful. We lift all these prayers up to you. Amen. And now I would like to invite Oliver to the front, who's going to share a testimony with us. to just start by saying that, uh, well, thank you for praying for me in uh, 2021, November. Um, that, that's the last time that I was here standing. Um, yeah, so uh, we were uh, praying for uh, the process of me getting married uh, to my wife in Albania. Uh, that went well, uh, so thank you for that. Um, so uh, for those of who don't uh, have uh, the background story, I'll give a little bit of details, and if you have more questions, feel free to ask me in that service. Um, so we met online in uh, 2021, uh, March, so during lockdown season. Um, yeah, and uh, we uh, talked every day for pretty much like two hours a day at the time, so we got to know each other pretty well. Uh, we decided to meet in the summer for her birthday and uh, was uh, there for two weeks. I flew over there. Um, at, uh, while I was there, uh, we decided to get engaged. And then uh, we were uh, getting uh, the wedding process uh, prepared after that. Um, so after, yeah, between then and uh, December 2021, when we got married, uh, we were just uh, getting papers ready, and that's when I was up here. So that's the background. So since then, um, I moved over there uh, because, uh, well, we knew that it was going to take some time to get the paper paperwork uh, ready for her to come to Canada, because from all uh, you need a visa at the very least, so it's not easy to the country. So, um, yeah, uh, that said, um, yeah, so at the time when we were praying, uh, I mentioned that I was expecting to be away for three to six months. As you know, I've been away here longer than that, so that's part of why I'm here right now. Um, the three to six months period technically actually did happen, so we have applied for a visitor visa at first, uh, shortly after getting married, uh, that ended up getting refused three months later. Then uh, I decided at that time that it would probably be best to apply for uh, permanent residence uh, from there. Um, I, yeah, the, the, the thought process originally was that we were going to try to bring her here and then apply for permanent residence here so she would have been allowed to stay here the entire time while it was being processed. Now that's the opposite because we applied from abroad. Uh, she has to stay away until that's finished. So that's kind of the background story on that front. Uh, we also applied for a student visa that also got rejected. So that was like the six month period, like around June basically. So <laughs> basically both times we did get an answer, but not the one we were hoping for. Um, yeah, so that gives the, the background for the immigration process, I suppose. Uh, otherwise, uh, I guess, background on how things have been. Things have been fine. We've been uh, living in an apartment in the capital. Uh, yeah, we've been attending her uh, home church. It's like 40 minutes north from there. Uh, yeah, just getting to know her family. The language is really difficult, actually. It doesn't have any roots in Latin or Cyrillic. Or, sorry, not Cyrillic, uh, Slavic or whatever. Anyway, so it's, it's quite difficult to learn. I do have an app. I should be using it more often. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, life together has been good uh, and challenging, both. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think that's good enough for like background info. Uh, and uh, yeah, for I have a couple points here saying about where you kind of sitting hand about in your journey. Um, well, definitely a lesson of patience. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, well, yeah, like. Uh, being thankful for seeing his uh, provision, I suppose, uh, throughout uh, 
throughout the process, even though we're not where we would like to be, we're still like completely covered. Like no no issues for you know where we're staying, food, like everything's you know everything's well on that front. So uh, yeah, I think that covers everything at least uh, that I have on my book plan. So uh, that's I'm the prayer request would be that uh, hopefully okay one detail actually sorry. <laughs> Uh, January, we did get an answer. Uh, not not a complete answer. It's um, uh, so I've been in touch with the MP's office since July, and uh, in January they got back to us saying that they're expecting for it to arrive between um, like end of March, beginning of April. That's what they said. That's unofficial news, unfortunately. It's not from the mouth uh, directly. So we're you know taking that with a grain of salt. Uh, we would like it to be true, and it sounds like plausible from everything that we see. But nonetheless, I guess it's just like praying that that would actually become the case, or no hiccups, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think that's it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, just uh, praying that, uh, yeah, that the process might be smooth, and also that uh, hopefully it would finalize uh, soon. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to be lost. <laughs> no, I was going to say the wife, but I don't like to do that. <laughs> so, Lord, I uh, just want to pray for Oliver and Michaela. Lord, it's, just, it's been a long journey. It's been a long process. And Lord, we just ask for your hand in this, Lord. Uh, we know you, your, your will is in your time. And you will make it happen when it is the right time, Lord. So we just ask you to be in this journey and continue to be in this journey with with all of Michaela, Lord, and we, we ask that this, this tentative date, perhaps in March or April, be true, Lord, that it be a sign from you that this is the time when she's to come, it is the right time. And we thank you for the time that Oliver's had over there with her family, Lord, that it's been a journey, a process, and that familiarity that they've gotten to know each other, Lord. So we thank you, and, uh, and we just we rest upon you, knowing that you will. And now we welcome Pastor Bruce to the front. Thank you. Good morning, church. Uh, and I'll just add my little commentary with the Oliver's story that uh, Bernard and I had opportunity to meet with him and uh, Michaela, his uh, beautiful wife, over Zoom and got to know her and uh, looking forward to meeting her in person. So, I am going to continue on this, this series, Being a Person of Faith, the Being series. Um, and uh, this is part two of the whole aspect of faith, exploring that important part about faith. And we, we dived into this, into this definition last week with Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. It is the, and then I, you know, I, I taught you about the, <clears throat> some of the more intricacies of the Greek language there, of, uh, of, of how assurance is, is all about that structure, the strength of the structure that's, that upholds that which was, is above it. And so the things that are above it, the things that we can't know, the things we hope for, the things we can't see in life. And the understructure is your faith. And I likened it to the deck that I had built that I could drive a truck out onto. And so when your faith is strong, you can, you can know what the, how str that which supports the things that you can't know. You have the assurance and the confidence Faith is such that you cannot be a Christian without it. You just can't be a Christian without faith. You know, we, we know that passage from John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he, he sends his only son. He sends Jesus to die for us. God does, the Father does the sending. Jesus does the dying. And look what we're supposed to do. That whoever believes in him, they're the ones 
that will inherit eternal life. They're the ones that God says, okay, you've got the courage to trust me and believe in me. Those are the people I'm seeking. Those are the ones that I will take on to my kingdom, to eternity. So faith is absolutely central to being a Christian. And I just want to take the moment to say, you may say, you know, like, I enjoy going to church. I enjoy singing. I, I met a man who once said, yeah, I go to church because I, I like to sing. That's it. I don't really, I'm not really into the rest of it. I just like to sing. You might come because you say, well, you know, I was baptized or my parents come or, or and you come along and, you, and there's some things that are good about it and you like it and stuff, but you're just not sure about the whole faith thing. Like, that's kind of stretching it for you. You know, like, um, I don't know, even know if God's real. Or, or, or I don't know if I can really trust the Bible. Or, and if that's you, fair enough. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you came. And you're always welcome. You're always welcome. Because the journey begins, has to begin somewhere. The journey has to begin somewhere. And don't assume that other people, that just because they walk through the doors, oh, their faith is strong and solid and they believe absolutely everything. No, probably not. There's a lot of people that have a variety of beliefs and they're at different places. But let me just be clear about one thing, right? I don't want you to be deceived. If you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're just not certain about that. You're not sure what you believe there. Then you're not a Christian. You're not. You may call yourself a Christian, but according to what Jesus says, according to the Bible, you're not a believer. And I just wouldn't want you to be deceived about that. Okay? Because as we see, it's those who believe. They are the ones that God will save. So this whole thing of faith is so fundamental to being a Christian. If you read Jesus, that is, you grab the New Testament and you just start looking, you know, if you have a red letter Bible that always just puts in red where the things that Jesus says, and you just focus on what Jesus talks about, man, you will find that that Jesus is always all about faith. He's always seeking faith. He's encouraging faith. He, he's always trying to draw out faith. He, do you know where this line comes from? With no one in Israel have, have I found such faith. Who does he say that to? He says it to the centurion, the soldier. Because he comes to the, the soldier comes to him and says, you know, I got this really sick servant. Can you come heal him? And, and Jesus starts to go with him and then he goes, oh, hold it. No, you don't need to come with me. I'm a man in authority. I'm a soldier. I, I can tell this other soldier, like, he's under me. You will get me this and you, go, you will get me that and you go do this. And, and he says, they have to obey me because that's what authority does. And, and, and he says, so you're a man in authority. You just tell the sickness to leave. Just, just do it. And Jesus says, that's faith. That's faith. I've never met anyone in all of Israel that has the faith that this Roman centurion has. Or three times, Jesus says to people that he heals, your faith has made you well. Your faith. Like Jesus is always trying to encourage faith. He's always trying to bring it forward. There's a, uh, you might know this scene in Mark 9 where the, uh, the guy has a, a son, a father has a son, and he's demon possessed. He says, You know, oh, this demon's been trying to kill my son. He throws him in the fire, he throws him in water, he, he's like trying to kill him. And Jesus talks to him and says, Yeah, it's been like, like that since birth. And, and then the guy says this to Jesus. You can do anything 
Have compassion, have some mercy on us and help us. Now I said Jesus is always trying to encourage faith. He's always trying to encourage faith. But he won't short sell it either though. Because that's not faith. That's not faith. If, you know, like, uh, that's a gambler's perspective. You know, can you help us? Because if you can, that'd be great. Because if you can't, I'll just move on and see who else can help me. Like, if you can, that'd be great. And uh, so Jesus just says, what do you mean, if? If you can? Because all things are possible for him who believes. In other words, you have to have faith. And, and, and then the guy, I love the man, the father's response, because he just says, yeah, I believe. Uh, help my own belief. You know, we look at that and we go, is that faith? Because that kind of seems a little wishy-washy, you know. But Jesus acts on that. Jesus actually heals his son because of this. And I go, man, God loves honesty. Just God loves, this is where I'm at. This is all the faith I have. And I think there's two things at play here. That one, there has to be a nugget of genuine faith in that. And then two, Jesus is always encouraging faith. That's all you got. It's only as small as a mustard seed. Well, man, we can work with that. And he's always encouraging faith. So as uh, that definition said, you know, faith is all about the things we don't know, the things we hope for, the things we can't see. And if you think about it, that's a massive topic. That's a massive topic, the things we can't actually know. Let me come at it from this way. Think, you know, you, we all have memories. Think about your childhood for a moment. How far back do your memories go? How far back? And I know I meet people and they have memories from when they're three. I, I don't. I have very poor memories, you know, and I can't remember them. And my dad took a lot of the camera, the old black and white movies, and we watched them over and over. And I think my memories are tied to those, to the scenes I've seen. But my actual true memories, they don't go back that far. I don't know about you, you know, maybe that's a discussion for you afterwards. But does anybody have memories like from under three or less? Oh, we got some. Yeah. Any from under two? One? Less than a year? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so here's the follow up question to that. When did you start to be? When were you, you? You know, like, and that's not a moral question in terms of, well, like conception. And, uh, that's not where I was going with that. Um, but just, like, philosophically, like, when did, did you become you when you started to think and have memories? And, like, it's a mystery, right? It's a mystery. So I was on retreat last week uh, with, up at Viv and Sue's place in Van Cleef Gill, and, and I got to one part, and the retreat was mainly silent retreat, so a lot of thinking and writing and reading. And, and at one point they said, um, you know, you might take a piece of art back to your room, and, and you can look at it and see how it inspires you. And I started to shut down when they said that. <laughs> art doesn't inspire me. Pictures of nature do, but actual art, it just, it isn't me. I know it might be you, and, and that's not a judgment thing. It just, it doesn't do a lot for me. But I, I, I don't want to discourage them, and so like, I, I was like, okay. I'll, and I picked a piece and brought it back to my room, and I couldn't actually find it on the internet, but these two pictures resemble what the picture I had. And it was just, it was like the one on the left with the two hands, and, but it had the little baby in the center of the two hands. 
and uh, it was a, just a picture of a bronze set of hands. And I just propped it up on my desk and then went back to my journaling and praying and reading the Bible and stuff. And then at some point, I glanced at it and I went, it hit me. I was that small once. I was that big once, and so were you. And, and, and then I realized, like, I have no memory of that. I have, I have no concept of what that was, life was like like that. But God does. God actually, it hit me. God saw me. God knew me in that moment. And see, that's my faith informs me on the things I can't know and the things I can't see. And, uh, you know, we, the scriptures inform us. This is David, King David, and, and he cries out. He says, you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made, being made in secret. And then he goes, he talks in that psalm about, man, I can't get away from God. God sees me. He knows all my thoughts. He's behind me. He's before me. He knows all my ways. And then he gets and he says this. Such knowledge, this idea that there's a creator and a being who knows everything about me, even knows before I speak what I'm going to say. He says, that's just way too amazing, too wonderful for me. And he says, I, I, I can't get it. I can't attain it. I can't comprehend that. And David's right. We can't. Because it's just mystery. It's, it's unknown to us. And so that whole field of that which is unknown, life itself, you know, that uh, Genesis informs us. God breathed life into us. Okay? So... What were we before he breathed the life into us? Were we just dust, inert dust? What were we? What's life? It's this massive mystery. The Bible's unyielding in teaching us that life comes from God. Everything comes from, from God. And that's why it calls us to have faith in him. In these, because there's so much we cannot know and cannot see. That's part of what makes life, like, what makes faith challenging, right? There's so much that makes faith challenging. It's, uh, it is, can be hard, right? Because it involves risks. You don't actually get a contract from God that God says, yeah, uh, you push faith in me, I will uh, be with you and I'll get you to heaven. Here's my signature. And so then days when you're not sure about faith, you can't go back and find that piece of paper and look and go, oh yeah, that's what he said, and, and there's his signature, I got that filed away, I'm good. No, he doesn't do that. And he doesn't make personal appearances in general. He doesn't give firm, hard handshakes. So faith does involve a risk. And faith, what else is hard about faith is it asks you to give up control. Because at some level it's asking you to trust that there's someone else in charge. And that's hard. We, we think, oh no, 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 we, God's in charge and we want God to be in charge. But then the moment things don't go our way. <laughs> Faith is, truthfully, not actually natural to us. You probably learned at a fairly young age, whether you thought about it or not, that you can't rely on everybody. People are going to let you down. And so you learn innately that if you want to get it done, you got to do it. And Nobody else necessarily going to do it for you. So you learn to rely on yourself pretty early in life. And then someone comes along and says, oh, by the way, you need to put your faith in this 
being that you cannot see. And that's so, it's just, faith isn't natural. It's counterintuitive to our experiences. And it works against your pride. Because it's that whole thing of you not being in charge. And so faith, and partially I tell you this, because as Christians, sometimes we just assume, like, why can't you believe, buddy? You know? Are you going to go it alone when you die? Who's, who, who's dying for your sin? For the unbeliever. And we, we can't understand why they don't believe. Faith is hard. Faith is hard. So if nothing else, it might help you to understand that person who can't believe, who struggles to believe. It's not natural. It does actually take courage to believe. I came across this this week in my devotions, and, uh, and this guy, Paul Tripp, he just, he says, sure, you'll face difficulty. God is prying, open your fingers so you'll let go of your dreams, rest in his comforts, and take up his call. In other words, what he's saying is, God might orchestrate your life in such a way that he's literally pushing back the fingers so you let go of control and you stop trying to control things so that you can just rest in what he gives you and what he's put in your life. And does that sound easy? Does that sound easy to do that? Faith is hard. Faith is challenging. Many Christians know this passage from the Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways acknowledge God. In all your ways. And he will make your path straight. Well, <laughs> good luck with that. It's not easy. That's not easy. It requires surrender. I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. There are things I cannot know, cannot see. And yet God asked me to trust him in those. So faith in itself will ask you to trust that he sees what you cannot see, that he knows what you cannot know, that he's got plans that are not your plans. You can have no conception of what they'll be. Faith requires you to trust God. <laughs> and that's where it gets hard. When he doesn't give you what you want, what you ask for. I, uh, as a pastor in my journey, I come up against a lot of Christians who say things that I don't agree with. And a lot of them start with this line. We know God doesn't want us. And then they'll say things like, God doesn't want us to be sick. God doesn't want us to be poor or to fail or to be persecuted. And usually that's packaged around some type of health, wealth, and prosperity type of a gospel, uh, which is an inch deep and a only an inch deep, but a mile wide. And... Um, What's missing in this is the question, how do you know God doesn't want that? How do you know? Like, what? I used to have this professor in Bible college that would say, as soon as some student spouted something about God, he'd always just say, he'd just say chapter and verse? Chapter and verse? In other words, where is it in the Bible? Where does it say that? Because if you come to the conclusion God doesn't want us to be sick, 
Well, you got to cut out an awful lot of scripture of biblical characters who got sick. It, there's, it doesn't line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with what God says. So what makes it faith hard is we don't want to be sick. We don't want to be poor. We don't want to fail. We don't want to be persecuted. So we often ask God that all those things would be avoided. And yet he doesn't bail us out sometimes. And so he's asking us to trust him in the midst of our sickness, in the midst of our poverty, in the midst of our failures, in the midst of persecution. He's asking us to trust him. I got plans you don't know about. I'm the one in charge, not you. That's why faith is hard. Faith is hard. Can't see it. Can't know. But that's what faith does. That's what faith is. That's why faith is not for cowards. I always say that about parenting. Parenting's not for cowards. Neither is faith. So, just to wrap it up, I don't know what God is asking you to trust him with. Where he's asking you to have faith. Is it something to do with your future? Is it something to do with a relationship, with health? Something to do with a loved one? It's not natural. Your, fight, your pride will fight against you. You will desire to control the circumstances. And, those, and your pride will try to convince you that you need to take control. Don't just trust God on this. Don't just step out. But that's what he's asking of you. He's asking you to trust him in the midst of it. And the starting point is always Jesus. If you've never actually put your faith in Jesus, as I said at the start, you may call yourself a Christian, but actually you're not. If you've never actually trusted Jesus, you're not a Christian. And that's where you need to begin by just Stepping out, everybody who is a Christian began at some point by taking a risk and stepping out and going, this is all the faith I have. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with all my doubts. But this is all the faith I got. And Jesus encourages faith. He'll take that. And that can be your starting point. So, I don't know what God's asking you to trust him with. But you know, maybe as we move to communion, you can be thinking about that to say, yeah, faith is so important. It's central. I need to trust God. And, and I think you know in your knower you know in your gut what he's asking you to trust you with. So will you have the courage to do that? Because that's what he seeks. Those are the people he's looking for. Those are the people he's saving. Those are the people he's taking with him. I hope it's you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ruben's going to come up and he's going to assist me in uh, our time as we move to a time of communion. <clears throat> when we do actually start the movement to uh, come to the front, uh, we'll just ask that the people on this side go first as we come around and just follow the order. It just moves a little.
more efficiently that way when we play is there. Uh, Ruby, do you want to begin by uh, praying for the bread, please? God, as we approach this table, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who convicted us of our shortcomings. He convicts the world, each and every one of us, Lord, of our shortcomings. You convict us, and we know we need a Savior. And for those of us who put our trust that Jesus died, gave up his life, took a beating for our sins, we remember. And for those of us who haven't put our trust in that moment, we pray that the Spirit continues to convict them, tell them that they're short. We are all short, and we need a Savior. And we come to this cross, we come to this table now, Lord, and we just, you died for us. You took my penalty, Lord, and we just give thanks because we are unworthy. But you, the worthy one, took our sin, and we put our trust in that, no matter what. And we come on this table for that. In Jesus' name. So the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, probably didn't look a lot like this, and he tore it, and he said, this is my body. Uh, I'm going to be torn like this bread. I'm going to die. My body's going to be torn apart. He said, whenever you do this, whenever you celebrate the Passover, for us Christians, whenever we we celebrate the communion with the bread and the juice. It says, whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He also took the cup. It would have been a larger bottle of wine, skin probably, or some type of pottery dish. And he pours out the wine for his disciples, and he said, and you can't miss the fact that that wine has the red wine that's so similar to the color of blood. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In other words, I'm going to die. God's making this new agreement through my death. You put your faith in me, and I will save you. And so he says, whatever you drink, do it in remembrance of me. So we will take the bread, the cup, and we will remember. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cup. I thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, that, that we might be forgiven, that your death would replace our debt all the sins and all the things that we've done in this world, that your blood can cover that, your death for my death. I trust you and I believe that. Thank you. Thank you that that's what you've asked. Bless your people, I pray, Jesus. Amen. So I ask you, if you want to participate, if you know I have put my faith in Jesus and you want to participate in this, get up, come around, pick up your element and return to your seat and then we'll take together.
It is in faith that we trust. That Jesus' death covers our sins. And the bread is a symbol of his broken body. Take and eat. It's an act of faith that we trust that his blood was shed to bought our sin. Take and drink.
Father, we are clinging to you. There is no God but you. Jesus, we have put our stacked, pushed all our chips in the table. We are holding to you. We are trusting you. This is our faith. Help us with our unbelief. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for the conviction that you have. Thank you for the testimony that you give to our hearts. Encourage your people this day that we would be people of faith. Thank you, Lord. It is in Christ's name. So wherever you go, whatever you do, you are a person of faith. You represent Jesus Christ. So do that well. Amen.